I'm gonna invite you to take your Bibles now and find Joshua chapter number 10. Joshua chapter number 10. We are uh, continuing our series on Sunday mornings, the book of Joshua entitled um, Forward by Faith and started last Sunday the message where I was trying to get to Joshua 9 and 10, but y'all listened way too slow, all right? And so I only got through Joshua 9 and we're gonna pick up Joshua 10 today. So I wanna read the first 15 verses of Joshua chapter number 10. The message is entitled from last week and today, A Failing People and a Faithful God. A Failing People and a Faithful God. Would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. Joshua chapter number 10, and I'll begin to read in verse number one, reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly. Because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Pyram, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, by the way, I ought to get a raise just for pronouncing all those names right there in that verse. Amen. Amen. He sent to them, saying... Come up to me and help me and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekah and Makedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel." So Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Let us pray. Father, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, what we are not make us for the glory of God through the power of your Holy Spirit merited by the person and the great glorious work of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And may our great God, may you, our great God, receive glory out of this time together. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me remind you of the big idea of these two chapters as I see it. And simply this, God is faithful even through our failures. God is faithful even through our failures. I believe that's one way of looking at the entire message of the whole Bible. That the entire message of the Bible is summed up in this way, that it's the story of a failing people and a faithful God who is faithful even through our failures. Chapter 9 was the story of a failing people. At the end of chapter 9, we have Israel in covenant with a Canaanite people. How did that happen? How did that happen? Because they failed to recognize deception. The people of Gibeon deceived them, and they were caught by that trickery. They failed to recognize deception because they failed to ask the Lord's direction. Verse 14 of chapter 9 says, So the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. They did not ask counsel from the Lord. So they made a covenant of peace with this Canaanite people. And what do you do when you find yourself having made a hasty, perhaps foolish, and even sinful decision? Well, you do what the people of Israel did. You, you make yourself as faithful, you live as faithfully as you can in the midst of that brokenness, in the midst of that broken situation. And they did that. They applied biblical principle to their difficult situation and learned to live faithfully. And they kept their covenant. How do we know? Because that's what chapter 10 is about. If chapter 9 is the story of a failing people, then chapter 10 is the story of a faithful God. A faithful God. In spite of Israel's failures, God remains faithful. Chapter 10 begins with this one named Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem. By the way, isn't it something that this city, Jerusalem, the city of the king where God would make his name dwell and that be his place of habitation, the Bible says, that here it is a hostile people with a hostile leader to God and to his purposes. So this leader of Jerusalem, king of Jerusalem, and Adonizedek heard what Joshua had done and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and they were among them, by the way, Regardless of how they got there, they are now in the people of God. They are now grafted in to this people in covenant with God and his people, and they are living among them. When he heard that, he feared greatly because Gibeon, he says, was a great city, that all its men were warriors. And this city, with all of this warrior faithful, they did not rise to fight. Instead, they humbled and surrendered to the God of Israel and made peace. When he heard that, he gathered together an, uh, a, a council of kings and they came together to fight against Gibeon. And the Bible says they made war against it. I, I, by the way, just something that the Lord kind of helped me to see in this, I, I don't have a point for this, but let me give it to you anyway, is that this people, Gibeon, that they made peace with the people of Israel, were grafted into God's family, and then opposition arose from those who were still hostile to God. I need to tell you this. We want you to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We feel an urgency to declare to you the gospel and say that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you should repent lest you perish. Repent and believe the gospel. But hear me when I tell you this, that when you bring yourself in submission to God, when you align yourself with God's people and God's purposes, you can be assured that those who hate God, that those who oppose God, that they will stop being your friend and they will become your enemy. Amen. And you can expect that. But you can also expect that when you find yourself in that kind of opposition, help will come. Help will come. And so the men of Gibeon, they cry out. 
They send to Joshua and say, remember, we are your servants. That phrase comes again and again in chapter nine and here again in chapter 10. We are your servants. Come quickly and save us and help us and help does come. Help comes from Israel, but more so help comes from the Lord. The God of Israel is faithful in this text, number one, to help his people, to help his people. And as the people of Israel go to keep their word and come to the aid of the people of Gibeon, the Lord does a great work. The Lord said to Joshua in verse eight, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. That is the consistent language of assurance throughout the book of Joshua. I have given them into your hands. Therefore, do not be afraid. Not a man of them shall stand before you. And so Joshua comes upon them and the Lord, the Bible says in verse 10, here's the first instance of supernatural help that comes. Verse 10, and the Lord threw them into a panic. The Lord routed them, some translations say. He threw them into a panic and as they fled, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. And here is the statement. Now, Israel's fighting, but God is fighting, and what God does matters more. Because at the end of verse number 11, it says, there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Two times in this text, the Bible says that the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord is the divine warrior who is fighting for his people. He is the warrior and he is the victor and he is fighting for his people. He is the source and the cause of Israel's victory. And by the way, did you notice here that God, the creator, he even employs the work of his creation to ensure that his purpose will stand and that his people will be victorious. He throws down hailstones on these people. Preacher, There's a preacher by the name of Dale Ralph Davis who says about the God of Joshua 10 that no mild God or soft Jesus can give his people hope. Listen to me. We do not serve a mild God. We do not worship a soft Jesus. We worship a divine warrior who will literally move heaven and earth and employ the weapons of his own creation, turning them against his enemies to ensure his people's success and their victory. This is our God. He is faithful to help his people. Now I wanna take a bold chance here because I hadn't, didn't mark it in my Bible, but I want you to hear how in the prophet Habakkuk, there is a commentary on this. I said a bold chance because I don't, I don't know where Habakkuk is in my Bible, so I got to try to find it. <laughs> I know it's before the New Testament. I know it's in the prophets. So here's what I do. Here's, here's what you should do. You open your Bible in the middle and you begin to flip and look for the right name. That's what you do. Amen. I found it. I talked long enough. Y'all thought I was, but I was just flipping my Bible the whole time and I found it. <laughs> Habakkuk chapter number three and listen to this kind of almost a, a, a commentary or perspective on what happened here. Habakkuk 3, verses 11 through 13. The Bible's, let me, let me begin back in verse number 10. I'll just start there. The mountains saw you and writhed. 
The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place. That's coming in just a moment. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. This is our God who goes out for the salvation of his people and will move heaven and earth to ensure their success. He is faithful to his people. The Lord fought for his people. Can I tell you, God is still fighting for us. He is a warrior who is fighting for his people. And the Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He is fighting for us, faithful to help his people. Number two, he is faithful to hear his people. Let me just say this, by the way. If you're out there today and you're in a battle and you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you do not fight alone. You do not walk alone. You do not fight alone. Our God is fighting with you. He is fighting for you and you can trust him. He's faithful to help his people and faithful to hear his people. Did you notice what happened? The Bible says that the Lord spoke to Joshua back earlier and then Joshua spoke to the Lord in verse 12. In the sight, by the way, he said what he said here, in the sight of all Israel, so all the people could see and hear and marvel at the power of God. And he said, sun, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? This is a a non-canonical book that was apparently a record of of poetic descriptions of great battles and warriors and the people of Israel and their history. Is it not written in this book, the Bible says, the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. No doubt something miraculous happened here. Say, preacher, what exactly happened? Are you ready for this? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Something happened. Something supernatural happened. Something miraculous happened. But the details are not quite so clear. If you want to know, ask Pastor Zach after the service but I don't know. I heard about a, a school somewhere, a, a training school for, for ministers somewhere, and, and one of the professors there was a very well-known scholarly guy, and when visiting preachers who had graduated from the school would come back to preach, he'd come to hear them one time. And one particular well-known preacher came back to preach in chapel that that vaunted professor, that, that uh, wonderful man came back and sat in the chapel. And when the service was over, he made a beeline for that preacher. And he said to him, I've heard you once. I will not come to hear you again. And the preacher thought he had done a terrible job. He said, what did I do wrong? I got a wrong vocabulary or had a wrong Greek or Hebrew, or whatever it was. I, I said something heretical. He was so concerned. And he said, why is that? And the professor said, I only come back to find out if our graduates, listen now, are big godders or little godders. If they have and talk about a big god or a little god. And if I find out that they are big godders who believe in and who preach about a big God, I know they're going to be okay and there's no need to come back a second time. Friends, I'll tell you something. 
at Pine Terrace Baptist Church, we believe in a big God. Amen. We believe in a great big God. Amen. A God who is big and can do all his holy will. How do you explain a miracle? The best answer is the answer of faith. The Lord is God and nothing is too hard for him. And nothing is outside of his disposal to do with as he wishes for the good of his own purpose and the blessing of his own people. Kent Hughes in his sermon on this text says, for all their future history, the people of Israel would know that the Lord, the sovereign creator, used his sovereign rule over his created order to accomplish his purposes for his people. God, the creator, can speak to his creation and it obeys his will. And he literally, literally can bend heaven and earth under the power of his word and his will. It was a bona fide miracle. But do you notice the emphasis of the text? What does the text say about this extraordinary experience? Verse 14, there has been no day like it before or since. Why? Because of this great cosmic disturbance, this cosmic supernatural miracle? No, there's been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man. When the Lord heeded the voice of a man. God did what he did here in some way in response to Joshua's cry unto him. In Joshua's prayer, in response to Joshua's prayer, the Bible says that day was unique, not so much for some unusual daylight or darkness, but because God listened to this man's prayer. Isn't it still amazing that God listens to the voice of a man or a woman that comes to him? Someone said that God responding to our cries is like the President of the United States sending out the naval fleet to rescue a termite on a piece of driftwood in the Atlantic Ocean. In case you're wondering, in the illustration, we are the termite on the driftwood in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and the God of heaven dispatches the resources of heaven and earth of the cry and the good of his people. Joshua is walking in God's will. God had spoken to him. He had divine revelation and assured of the sure and certain knowledge of God's will. Having that, he spoke boldly and faithfully and God responded. And the Bible says that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. God still listen to the cries of his people that are walking in his will and cry out unto him according to that revealed will. God is faithful. Somebody said, ought we not to catch our breath? Ought we not catch our breath to think that the God who is seated on high stoops down low and bends his ear to lips of dust and ashes. And yet, that is the truth of the Bible about our prayers. 
that the God of heaven stoops down and bends his ear to the cry that come from the lips of dust and ashes. God is faithful to help his people. He fought for Israel. God is faithful to hear his people. And thirdly and lastly, God is faithful to crush his enemies. He's faithful to crush his enemies. Now, beginning in verse 16, what we discover is that these five kings, this coalition of kings and opposition, they fled and hid themselves in a cave. And Joshua said, just put stones at the door of the cave and then leave them there. You've got work to do. So they went back, they, they walled up the cave, capturing the kings inside who had hidden themselves there. They went and they finished off the enemy and then they come back to deal with the kings. And Joshua says, take those stones away from the mouth of the cave and bring those kings to me. And then he calls for the elders of the people, the leaders of the people, and he says to them, come and put your feet on the necks of these kings as a sign of their defeat, of your victory, of God's victory, of God's faithfulness. And here's what Joshua says when he tells them to come and put their necks on them. He says, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. They do that. And then Joshua says to them in verse 25, verse 25, Joshua says to them, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous. That's the echo of chapter number one at the beginning of this whole thing. Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous for thus for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And he strikes down all these kings and makes them a public spectacle, hanging them on five trees until evening, bringing them down and threw them in back into that cave where they had hid, which was now their tomb and put the stones back in place to cover up their dead bodies. And so they there remain, verse number 27 says, to this very day. And the end of this chapter is the story of the defeat of king after king after king after king as the Lord gives all of his enemies into the hands of his people. And verse number, verse number 41 says, And Joshua struck them down from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen as far as Gibeon. And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. They returned to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal. Friends, they listen to me now. What you've just heard is the story of the whole Bible. Because in way back in the book of Genesis chapter 3, on the other side of the fall into sin and the curse and judgment that comes, there's a gospel promise in foreshadowing. That's foreshadowed for us where it says there in Genesis 3.15 that there will come the seed of the woman. He says this to the snake. God says this to the serpent. The seed of the woman will come and you will bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. And here, these kings are the seed of the serpent and the people of God are a part of the line of the seed of the woman and they put their feet on their necks symbolically crushing their head. Anybody else here smelling what I'm cooking in this place? 
He says, all your enemies. Thus she shall do to all your enemies. And what does the Bible say in Romans 16, 20? Paul says there as a parting shot to the Roman Christians, 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Friends, when Jesus Christ came and lived and died on the cross and rose from the dead, he was putting one foot on the serpent and one foot on hell and crushed them both under his feet when he got up out of that grave. And now he is ruling and reigning from heaven over all his enemies. And everything is put in subjection under his feet. And you and I, you and I share in that great victory. Brothers and sisters, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. He's won the victory. He's crushed the head of the serpent. The time is coming when all his enemies will be his footstool. He'll put his feet up in victory, in declaration that God has won. His enemies don't have the last word. They all will be crushed under his feet. Every single one. I know this world can be discouraging. I know times are difficult. I know things are disgusting in a lot of ways, but you just rest assured, my brother and my sister, the God of peace, the God of peace will come and he will crush Satan under his feet. That is our hope. That is the great story. That is what our God has done and what our God will do. The question is, are you lined up with the seed of the woman or the seed of the serpent? Will you be the one with your foot on the neck or will somebody else's foot be on yours? Because the only way to have this assurance, the only way to know this victory is to be aligned with the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, trusting him as Lord and Savior, owning him as the only true king and gladly submitting your life to him. Is that you? Have you done that? Why would you not want to do it? Why would you not do it today? Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Our praise team is coming. As they come, let's bow our heads for prayer. And after I say Amen. We will give an invitation. We invite you to come and lay down your arms of opposition to God and humble yourself and surrender to Him and trust Him and be at peace with Him and know His victory.